This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the Internet, as well as new listeners in Florida, Colorado, and the Portland and Chicago areas. Thank you for being with us. My guest today is one of the most recognized astrophysicists in the world, Dr. Mario Livio. And today we're taking a break from the 24-7 news coverage about the debt ceiling, health care, and partisan shenanigans in Washington. And we're going to really stand back and look at this self-important creature stuck on a small blue planet floating in space. And, well, we're going to try to get some perspective on why progress is an awkward and clumsy process, even for geniuses. But before Dr. Levio joins us, as is my custom each week... Let me give you a little background on how he came to be one of the most honored astrophysicists of our time. Mario Livio was born in Romania. His parents were forced to flee the country for political reasons, leaving Livio in the care of his grandparents. At age five, Livio, his grandparents, and parents were reunited and settled in Israel. Livio earned his undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics from Hebrew University and graduate degrees in particle physics from the Wiseman Institute and astrophysics from Tel Aviv University. He taught at the Institute of Technology through 1991 and soon afterwards joined the Space Telescope Science Institute, which operates the Hubble Telescope. He's known for his work on supernova explosions and the expansion of the universe, among other unexplained mysteries. I also want to add that Levio served as a paramedic in the Israeli Defense Forces during the Six-Day War the Yom Kippur War, the war in Lebanon, and in addition to authoring hundreds of scientific papers, he's the author of best-selling books, including The Golden Ratio, The Story of Pi, The World's Most Astonishing Number, which traces the use of the number pi in art, music, architecture, and the stock market, a discovery that author Dan Brown explored in The Da Vinci Code. Livio's also the author of The Accelerating Universe, the equation that couldn't be solved, and is God a mathematician, and is the recipient of more distinguished book and science awards than we have time to go into today. Livio's most recent book is called Brilliant Blunders, and it explores the near misses, mistakes, and about turns the most brilliant scientific minds in history have made, and why the road to great discoveries is never a straight line. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report one of our living legends in science, Dr. Mario Livio. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about your book, Brilliant Blunders. But uh, before we do, every day you're dealing with this really big picture, which is the origins and expansion and makeup of the universe. And yet 24-7, all you see on the news is our obsession with the foibles of man. So I wanted to open today's program by trying to get a better perspective on our place in the universe I, how do you balance, um, let's say, your role as a paramedic in a war or watching politicians duke it out over national health care against your awareness that we're just this one small little creature floundering around on a spinning ball in space? Yes, you're right. I mean, you know, we are on a very tiny planet around a very ordinary star in a very ordinary galaxy of which there are some 200 billion like that, you know, in our observable universe alone. Um, So that puts things a little bit in perspective. Also, the, you know, the stuff we're made of, we call this ordinary matter, we call baryonic matter, is only about four and a half percent of the energy budget of the universe. Um, So it's true that from a purely physical perspective, we are really just but a speck. Uh, At the same time, you know, when we talk about the universe, we're really talking about what humans discovered about the universe. And in that sense, you know, the human brain and the human knowledge is at the center of many things. And and this is where, you know, human life with all its struggles and things also come, you know, into the picture. But you will admit we seem to lack a proper perspective on what the human organism is and how it operates. I mean, as a sociobiologist by training, I'm 
I'm always surprised at how little we know about the long haul of human history and the role that that plays in our troubles today. And, and you must see our troubles from a very different perspective. You know, on one hand, yes, and on the other, of course, I'm troubled like, you know, everybody else. You know, if the government is shut down, then I'm troubled by that. And, uh, in fact, even, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope that we run is troubled by that in the sense that, uh, you know, if the government was shut down for a much longer period of time, then at some point, you know, NASA would not be transferring the funds needed to run the Hubble Space Telescope and so on. So it's hard to stay disconnected from, you know, everyday life and and all its problems. And yet when you are sitting at the telescope and you're looking at all of these galaxies and then you're wondering if they're going to cut off funding for the telescope, I mean, that has got to be a bit of an existential experience. It it, it is, it is. And, uh, you know, it's uh, like, you know, you're, you're going from one climax of thinking about you know, how the universe started and how it is evolving uh, and, uh, you know, running into questions whether or not uh, this or that uh, national park is going to be open when you will try to visit it, you know, things like that. So, uh, yes, un- unfortunately, this is part of human life. So you have one foot in both worlds. You have the foot in the world of scientific curiosity and looking at the big picture, and then the other foot in the practical foibles of life, uh, and somehow that works for you. Somehow that's navigating. So let me ask you this. Uh, if you had an opportunity, let's say, to go into North Korea, Iran, even our, even our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., where everybody would love to have someone who's got a foot in both worlds grab their shoulders and shake them up a bit. <laughs> uh, um, w- what would you say? How, how would you give them the perspective that you have? You know, I mean, I, I obviously try to stay out of politics as much as I can. So I'm not You're sure a smart that I man. Would, so I'm not sure I would <laughs> want to actually do that. Um, uh, but, you, you know, um, my feelings about these things are not any different than from, you know, non-scientists and so on. And in fact, one of the things I explore in, in, in the book, Brilliant Blunders, is how human, at the end, even the greatest geniuses are. You know, I mean, they, they suffer from the same shortcomings as the rest of us. That's right. Well, fundamentally, we're all trapped in the exact same biological uh, spacesuit, so to speak. That's right. And use the same type of hardware in, in in way of our brain, you know, and so on, and the software associated with it. That's right. And I, I, must, uh, I, I must say that I find your work, your writing, your perspective to be um, so grounded, and that must come from your family. Uh, your family must have been, you know, very, very down to earth and had some very traditional values. Uh of course, at some level, and of course, without the support of my wife and family, I could not have been doing what I'm doing because, you know, it takes long hours to write a book, and I do this uh, in addition to my day job at, at, you know, the institute that runs the Hubble Space Telescope. So I absolutely need all that support. And your purpose for writing the book, I think, is to reach out to more than the physicist community. To Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this this particular book, uh, and, and indeed my previous uh, books were were books in popular science. I mean, they are they are for anybody who is, uh, you know, uh, somewhat educated and and uh, curious about how science works. Uh, this book in particular, I, I wanted to correct what I regard as what is perhaps a misconception that uh, you know uh, progress in science and indeed in many other creative processes is regarded as this direct march to the truth uh, <laughs> when in fact it's it's not that at all and you did um, a wonderful job of of really portraying that in this book now we're going to have to take a, a short commercial break but when we come back we're going to hear about some of those brilliant blunders that scientists have made throughout history you're listening to the costa report Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? 
This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County. And we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it, bit? A lot of bit, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. A few years ago, I noticed I was feeling increasingly tired. My fatigue was so intense that I got to the point sometimes when I got home from work, I couldn't even remember the drive. The excessive tiredness and forgetfulness, not to mention my snoring that constantly woke up my husband, prompted me to get a sleep test. The results showed that I have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common disorder. In fact, 50 to 60% of those who snore have it. Many couples accept snoring as an inevitable part of nightly life, but sleep apnea is associated with serious health problems, such as the risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and even heart failure. Treatments for sleep apnea range from simple lifestyle changes to breathing machines to surgery. Treating my sleep apnea has changed my life. Armed with information, you too could be on your way to a restful night's sleep and a healthier life. Learn more at wakeuptosleep.org or call 877-389-8868. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Got a comment or a question? Visit Rebecca Costa's comment page at RebeccaCosta.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is acclaimed astrophysicist, humanitarian, and author, Dr. Mario Livio. And before the break, we were talking about the fact that even an astrophysicist who studies the vast reaches of outer space has to keep one foot in reality such as worrying about a government shutdown that might cut funding for the Hubble telescope. So your new book, Brilliant Blunders, describes some of the setbacks and miscalculations that great geniuses in science have made. Let's take Darwin, for example. Uh, He didn't have the benefit of um, and training in mathematics, and uh, Gregor Mendel hadn't come along and explained the mechanics of how traits move from parent to offspring. So so Darwin had to make up some imaginary processes in order to make the theory of nat- natural selection work. Is that right? 
Yeah, he basically adopted the theory of heredity that was, uh, you know, uh, prevailed, was prevailing at the time. Uh, but his blunder was in not realizing that with that type of theory of heredity, natural selection actually could never have worked. Well, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, sure, yeah. The, the theory of heredity that existed at the time was that the characteristics of the father and the mother sort of uh, get blended in the... In, in the offspring in the same way as you would mix paints or, or a gin and tonic, for that matter. Uh, but the thing is that if that happens, then, of course, the characteristic just gets diluted all the time. So, you know, suppose you have a thousand white horses and one black horse, and imagine that for some reason being black is a good thing. Uh, that black horse is going to mate with a white horse. You're going to get a gray horse. The gray horse will mate with another white horse. You'll get an even paler shade of gray, of a gray horse. So there is no way that that black would suddenly, you know, the whole population of horses would turn black, is is what Darwin wanted with his theory of natural selection. That's right. So if we had a can of black paint and a can of white paint and we mix them together, we get gray. We don't get, sometimes we get black, sometimes we get white, sometimes we get gray, which is obviously what happens when you have natural selection work. So he said things just sort of mingled together. I think he used, did he use a word called pargenesis or something like that? Pangenesis, he, yeah, he, he, yeah he, that was the, the, the solution he came up with, which mm-hmm. was, you know, unfortunately completely wrong. I mean, he, uh, he, it had the instructions going from the body to the cell instead of the other way around. He understood at the end that there was a problem. You know, the way genetics really works is more like shuffling of cards. You know, if you have an ace and you shuffle the cards, it remains an ace. So if having an ace is a good thing, you know, you will always have that ace. And that's what Gregor Mendel taught us. But uh, Darwin, unfortunately, didn't know about Mendel and therefore, you know, came up with a wrong correction for, you know, what he knew was a, a wrong theory. Right, right. And, and you also point out that Einstein sort of fudged a little when he discovered that the universe wasn't static. Right. He thought the universe was static, so, but he also knew that everything attracts everything else by the force of gravity. So he said, but how can it be static if everything attracts everything else? So he added the term into his equations that, you know, had a repulsive force that precisely balanced the attractive force of gravity. Now, when uh, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is in fact expanding, Einstein said, wait a second, if it's expanding, I don't need everything to balance. The gravity would just slow down the expansion. So he took that term out of his equation. (laughs) Now, this was, you know, it it looked like a good idea at the time, except that in 1998, we discovered that the expansion of our universe is, in fact, accelerating. It's speeding up. And what's driving that acceleration, we think today, is precisely that term that Einstein took out. So his mistake... Okay, so I want to try to understand this for our listening audience. Please. Okay, so uh, he decides the universe is static. He discovers it's not static. So he fudges a little and makes something up that makes the theory work. Then he discovers that, uh, in fact, uh, things are uh, changing uh, in real time. And uh, and he has new information, and he says, oh, well, then I don't need the thing I made up. So he takes that out of the equation. Right. But right. then we discover that the universe is not, in fact, slowing down in terms of expansion. It is accelerating. So he says, no, actually. No, he doesn't say, no, he doesn't say anymore. I mean, he didn't leave, unfortunately, to see that part. Right. So, so But, but, uh, but scientists anymore. came back and said, actually, he wasn't wrong after all. So the thing right. he made he up turned right out to be true. Time. That's right. So, I mean, you know, some people are such great geniuses that even when apparently they make a mistake, it turns out to be an insight rather than a mistake. So the mistake was right. What he thought was a mistake was, in fact, right. Except for we have to add so far. That's right. You're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely Uh, right. and, And that was the thing I wanted to add, by the way, at the end of each of these chapters, I wanted to say, and that's what we know so far. Did you sort of have that feeling as you were writing it? Yeah, and, and, you know, that's the story of science in general. I mean, 
this is exactly the greatness of science, you know, that theories are only correct for as long as we don't find anything to falsify them. I mean, you, you know, the great Karl Popper, one of the historians, philosophers of, of science, you know, said that we can never prove a theory right. We can only prove it wrong. Yes. So basically, theories hold true for as long as we didn't find anything that refutes them. So let's take another example, Hoyle's Big Bang Theory, which you write about. Yeah, well, this is a, a very, in some sense, it's, it's ironic. You see, Fred Hoyle was a, a, a great astrophysicist, and he coined the term Big Bang for the beginning of the universe. But he actually objected to that particular model. <laughs> he, he actually thought that the universe is in a steady state, that it never changes which was a very elegant idea, only that it turns out to be wrong. But it's ironic that the person who objected to the idea of a Big Bang is the person who coined the term that we all use. <laughs> so, so what did he mean when he said Big Bang Theory if he objected to the idea that there was an explosion that started everything moving? Well, he said, you know, I have my theory and you should contra- you know, contrast my theory with this other theory, which has in it this Big Bang, you know, he said. Uh, so, you, you, you know, he didn't treat seriously that other theory. He just used the term Big Bang. Mm-hmm. Now, in, that term caught. Now, in Hoyle's case, uh, has any information surfaced to make Hoyle right? Uh, no, about, unfor- the, about steady states? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> uh, with increasing information, it turned out that he was wrong. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, at old age, he became very, very stubborn, and uh, he refused to admit uh, till his last day that he was actually wrong. at old age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, I, you know, I think you're a, being kind. <laughs> that's that's on another trait that we kind of have. You know, we no we scientists a, <laughs> are stubborn. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we all I think tend to become a little bit more stubborn as we age. Well, uh, I have heard that stubbornness and tenacity are cells that touch in the brain. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, that may be very well be the case when it comes to scientific discovery. A little stubbornness, a little tenacity will go a long way uh, in terms of facing the number of failures that you have to overcome in order to truly make a real discovery. We have to take another uh, scheduled break, but we'll be right back to find out what we can learn from these great blenders. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Are you looking for ideas to create a more balanced meal plan? As one of the world's largest providers of fresh fruits and vegetables, Dole makes it easy to eat the right foods. From a wide variety of salad blends and all-natural salad kits to fresh-cut vegetables and a rainbow of your favorite fresh fruit, Dole delivers good nutrition naturally. But Dole goes beyond just offering healthy fruits and vegetables. Dole has their own nutrition institute that gives you the knowledge and tools you need to make smart choices about your nutrition and health. Visit www.dole.com for more information about the Dole Nutrition Institute. Be sure to sign up for their e-newsletter to receive delicious recipes, tips, and articles to help you make your meals the best they can be. Visit www.dole.com for more. Hello, I'm Ben Vereen. You probably know me for my singing, acting, and dancing on Broadway, television, and the big screen, but what you may not know about me is that I'm one of the 26 million Americans living with diabetes. My doctor diagnosed me four years ago. But now, with my blood sugar levels under control, I've been blessed to continue to do what I love to do, perform, and not let this disease, type 2 diabetes, hold me back. In fact, I've taken a stand for my diabetes, and I'm asking those of you with diabetes and those who love them to take this stand with me. Talk to your doctor today, and visit StandForDiabetes.org to learn more. That's StandForDiabetes.org. A public service of taking control of your diabetes made possible with support from Santa Fe U.S. Remember, if you have diabetes, it doesn't have to hold you back. 
Victor Ray, this is Scorpion 23, traveling west on MSR Vernon. Four Victors, 16 packs, request MSR status over. Roger, Scorpion 23, all MSRs and AOR red past 24 hours. Three IEDs on MSR Vernon. <laughs> always be casualties and for our wounded warriors coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself American troops who suffer traumatic injuries need the support of every American join us and send your message of support to our wounded warriors and their families at USO.org the USO until everyone comes home he worked out early practiced late, and studied well into the night. The next day, he did it all over again. She missed time hanging out and socializing with friends so she could make it on time to practices and games. He became a top student and a confident leader, even as he helped his team win back-to-back -back conference titles. She became a role model in her community, even as she led her team to an undefeated season. And when they finished playing high school sports, what did they do next? She graduated from college with honors and went to work for a successful company. He attended graduate school and became a difference maker in his community. Because that's what student athletes in California do. They use the skills they develop playing high school sports today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports. A winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Grab your smartphone and follow us on Twitter. Twitter.com forward slash Rebecca Costa. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is astrophysicist and author of Brilliant Blunders, Dr. Mario Livio. And before we went to break, you were describing some of the errors which Darwin, Einstein, and Hoyle made who were all great legends in science. And, and it, it appears that real discovery uh, that is scientific is, is filled with fits and starts and miscalculations. And sometimes we even invent imaginary, undiscovered things to make the theories work. Uh, but this is sounding more and more like intuition and instinct than any formal, rigorous scientific process that the person on the street associates with science. Or am I wrong? No, it's not intuition. Of course, you know, some great scientists also have, you know, certain, I would call it more insight than intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but no, I mean, science, the, really the way science progresses is that, you know, you can have many false starts. I mean, y you may remember, uh, I mean, there is a saying that is attributed to Edison that, you know, he used to say that, he, he he did not fail a thousand times in you know inventing the 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 light bulb. He he just found a thousand ways in which it doesn't work. Um, so uh, that's how science really works. Uh, it, you 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 have a certain theory. You have to test it. Uh, sometimes it turns out to be wrong, and then you take another turn at it, and so on. Uh, the the important thing, however, and that's one of the things I I try to emphasize in the book. And, and, and this distinguishes what I call brilliant blunders from other types of blunders is that I'm not advocating that you should be sloppy or, or, or careless. I mean, these were very, very clever and thoughtful people. They were just trying, you know, to think outside the box. And when you think outside the box, when you think in unconventional ways, then yes, many times, you know, you're going to make a blunder. And, and that's what happened with these particular scientists. But let me ask you, Dr. Mario, because I, I, I think that everyone is asking this question right now. How do you distinguish bad failure from good failure? How, how do you know if you have all these thousands or hundreds of failures that you're on to something? So, what, what makes a scientist know that he's on to something and to keep down that path? So you know, many times you don't know. First of all, you only know that something is a blunder or a failure after the fact. Of course, you don't know it ahead of the time or you wouldn't be doing it. Um, and 
so you don't know. I mean, many times you, you just have to try. You know, you try a number of things and until something works. Now, please understand that a lot of progress in, in, in science takes place incrementally. I mean, you know, people just take very, very small steps, and those careful steps uh, usually do lead to, you know, a certain progress all the time. Every now and then, however, you know, when to, you want to get to a real discovery or a breakthrough, this is when you have to think, you know, a little bit differently from the mainstream. And when you think a little bit differently from the mainstream, then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Look at all startup companies. You know, a vast ma majority of them actually fail. But a few that don't, you know, can lead to something uh, amazing sometimes. So that's how it works. But those are very high failure rates. Even in a venture capital situation, they might invest in 100 companies and only expect 85 or 90 to uh, be funded all the way through and succeed. You, you, I think 85 maybe fail out of the 100, no? That's I mean, right. 80, 85 uh, fail. Yeah, Did I yeah, say failing. it the other way around? Yeah, yeah, right. Well, that yeah, is I lack think. of sleep on my part. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and only the I am sleep succeed. deprived these days, and yeah. I, I think I got my numbers backwards. But yeah, 85 or 90 are not going to make it. So that's that, such that's a right. small percentage. Uh, that's right. But, but, you know, if you want to get to, to some of those, you know, real innovations, uh, that's what you have to do. Uh, like I said, I mean, you could take the, you know, the more secure path, and then, you, you know, you're likely to make progress, but perhaps not to get to the big breakthrough. But let's contrast that against where society is going together today. Yes. Uh, we are driven toward efficiency, and those Correct. models are not efficient. They're the opposite of efficiency. You're right. So, so there are many, many uh, circumstances in which that kind of attitude is not the right attitude. I mean, there are many, many uh, professions, processes, and so on, which should be done, you know, just carefully, incrementally, where you are almost certain as to what the result is going to be and so on. But if you take something like, you know, let's say take medicine, for example, you know, more than 50% of the new discoveries of, of new medications uh, happen serendipitously. Uh, you know, they, they were looking for something for blood pressure, and they find something that works for depression, and so on. And they realize that that's the situation, and you have to develop processes for particular types of professions which allow for these kind of serendipitous discoveries or for those outside the box thinking. And so you really do have to raise the threshold that you're willing to accept of failure. Correct, correct. For some things you have to raise that thre threshold and that's exactly what has happened with with startup companies and uh, also with some of the big discoveries. But when you think about it, uh economics is driving so much of the world today. And, you know, and those business mentalities and economic mentalities are to uh, are to drive toward greater efficiencies, better returns on investment. How do you reconcile that? I mean, I, I, you, you use an ex a good example in the pharmaceutical industry uh, where you have far more failures than successes, but the successes overwhelm the failures. That's right. So that's right. And that's what sometimes happened. Yes. I mean, you know, you have a certain company that uh, comes up with something that is so big that it really overwhelms all the previous losses. We seem to need new economic models for that kind of endeavor. Would you agree? Um, yes. I think especially, you know, things like funding agencies and so on should, should allow for this type of thing. And again, I, w I want to emphasize, I don't advocate careless processes or, or sloppy processes. I mean, everything should be thoughtful, but the process should allow for a certain level of thinking outside the mainstream where there is a potential for big return, even though it may lead to a blunder. Yes. Well, in the book that I wrote, I uh, had several chapters about what neuroscientists are discovering about insight, uh, where two or three or many pieces of data are connected in a novel way that we've never connected them before. Uh, That's right. And, and this process seems to be something that neuroscientists are being able to map 
they can see when, instead of using left brain or right brain processes, that the brain sort of starts to shut down peripheral uh, unimportant activities and and it almost as though it's storing up and uh and a small part of the human brain called the ASTG seems to light up like a christmas tree before someone's going to solve a problem that's way above their pay grade and and we've sort of made folklore out of that you know with newton uh, uh, an apple falling on his head and archimedes sitting in a tub and the water you know coming over the sides and discovering displacement theory i mean we we kind of made these things into legend what's your feeling about them uh, it, did we make folklore out of that is that something that we can train ourselves to do more of over time um, you know the folklore is, does not always you know represent of course the the actual true way in which things developed i mean uh, you know newton did not need to the apple to fall on his head to know that things fall down. I mean, of course, he knew <laughs> that before the apple fell on you his head. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and people knew that long before Newton. Um, so, uh, you know, Newton was starting to, to think about those problems as to, you know, why do things fall down and so on. And he, he knew about the moon, you know, being in orbit around the earth and so on. So, it's usually not as simple as that, as you know, that one particular event immediately triggers an entire theory, you know, and so on. Right, right, that's right. Uh, but these insights, they they seem to come on like a freight train, uh, despite the fact that people have think, been thinking about them for long periods of time. They All of a right. sudden, it's it suddenly seems to come together. Now, we have to take our last break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with Dr. Mario Livio. You're listening to the Costa Report. You asked and we listened. The new and improved paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle is now available in bookstores everywhere, including airports across the country. If you've been hemming and hawing about not having time to go online or pick up a copy, well, now you don't have any excuses. Find out why government gridlock, terrorism, epidemic obesity, crime on Wall Street, even problems with education and health care have an evolutionary basis to them. Because when you do, you'll never look at our problems the same way. So pick up the freshly printed paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle. Don't wait. Do it now. Give yourself a real reason to feel optimistic. That's The Watchman's Rattle, available everywhere you are. Fifty years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. But something you may not know is that Dr. King was represented by the world's foremost speaking agency, the American Program Bureau. The American Program Bureau has a courageous history of representing luminaries, entertainers, and motivators from all backgrounds. From Ronald Reagan, Richard Branson, and Mikhail Gorbachev to John Stewart, Michael Douglas, and Desmond Tutu. From A-list celebrities to best-selling authors, cutting-edge business leaders, and the greatest minds in academia, the American American Program Bureau has speakers to fit every venue and every budget. When corporations, conferences, schools, and community organizations need an expert speaker, they turn to the American Program Bureau to help them craft an event that will be remembered long afterwards. To inquire about a speaker for your next engagement, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or visit our website at apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. 
Hello, I'm Ben Vereen. You probably know me for my singing, acting, and dancing on Broadway, television, and the big screen, but what you may not know about me is that I'm one of the 26 million Americans living with diabetes. My doctor diagnosed me four years ago. But now, with my blood sugar levels under control, I've been blessed to continue to do what I love to do, perform, and not let this disease, type 2 diabetes, hold me back. In fact, I've taken a stand for my diabetes. And I'm asking those of you with diabetes and those who love them to take this stand with me. Talk to your doctor today and visit StandForDiabetes.org to learn more. That's StandForDiabetes.org. A public service of taking control of your diabetes made possible with support from Santa Fe U.S. Remember, if you have diabetes, it doesn't have to hold you back. If you missed any of today's interview, catch the entire episode on www.rebeccacosta.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is one of the most renowned astrophysicists in the world and author of the new book, Brilliant Blunders, Dr. Mario Livio. So moving along, let's talk for a moment about what we currently know about our place in the universe. It's clear from your book that even the most gifted among us stumble bumble around a bit. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's no question that millions of years of evolution have brought us to a remarkable point in time where we've climbed to the top of the pyramid um, where life on Earth is concerned. So let me ask you the question I think everyone's dying to know. How likely is it that we're going to discover extraterrestrial life that's superior to us and maybe they don't have to stumble bumble around like we do? So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you ask that because, you know, just a few days ago uh, we passed the 1,000th mark of confirmed extrasolar planets, uh, planets around other stars. So we, we passed, you know, the number 1,000 of those. And, and th- just to think how remarkable that is, think that until 1995, we didn't know of a single planet outside the solar system orbiting a sun-like star. And now we have more than 1,000 of them. Now, 12 of those even appear to be in the what we call the habitable zone around their their star, which means it's in that region around the star that's not too hot, not too cold, so that it allows for liquid water to be on that uh, planet. And the reason I mention that is that we think that liquid water may be a necessary ingredient for life. So, you know, this would be 12 pretty good candidates that some form of life may be exist there. Now, you asked a more complex question, which is, you know, how likely is it that there are more intelligent life forms than us? So I would say the following. I have no doubt whatsoever that there are many places in the universe that have life on them. I mean, there are billions of planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And as I said earlier, there are about 200 billion galaxies in our observable universe. So there is no question in my mind that there is life out there. Now, is some of that life likely to be ahead of us? Absolutely. And they could be ahead of us by a billion years. Now, how likely are we, fi- are we to find a civilization that's you know, more advanced than us by a billion years? Probably not very likely. Because we are like bacteria to them. If they want, we would never find them. So, you know, to find that highly intelligent life form may be very, very difficult, even though I'm convinced that they exist. I think what you're saying is if, we, if those life forms exist, it would be like us trying to talk to a virus. That's right. Exactly. And, 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 you know, in the way that we don't talk to viruses and we don't even study all of them, we, we study a few of them and so on, you know, this extraordinarily advanced civilization may say, oh, yeah, we know that those bacteria live down there, you know, and so on, but we have no interest in them. Now, you know, it's possible that we will get luckier and, you know, maybe the differences among some civilizations are no more than, you know, a few thousand years or something, in which case, 
you know, it would still be the case that one is much more advanced than the other, but maybe not to the extent that they cannot communicate. And in particular, we may be able to find some life forms that are less advanced than us, you know, like what we're doing currently on Mars, trying to see if there is some, you know, bacterial form of life perhaps, you know, there, and we may try to do that in other places in our own solar system. Well, it seems to me that... um... If we don't want to be attacked and killed off, we better be good bacteria. We better <laughs> you, we better mind our manners. You're right. Yes, I mean <laughs> because uh, think about what we do to bad bacteria. Not only to bad bacteria. What did we do when we conquered new worlds? I mean, right? I mean, within our own Earth, uh, we weren't particularly good, right? I mean, when you look at all those explorers that discovered new civilizations and so on. Uh, we weren't that great with them. So we have to kind of demonstrate that we are able to be, you know, in our best behavior and very tolerant. I think it's a good point. Um, On the other hand, if we don't even register as a concern, uh, then these Hollywood movies where the aliens are going to come down and take care of business, not likely. I kind of like the idea we're under the radar. How about you? (laughs) Yeah, it's it's possible, but you know, I would still like in my lifetime to to discover some life forms. I mean, even, even a single-celled not, organism would be a great right. discovery. Yeah, it would it would be fantastic because it would show us, you know, other conditions under which you know life is formed and so on. I think it would be amazing. So, uh, even if we will not discover during my lifetime another intelligent civilization, uh, it would still be great if we find life at all. That's true, and and I I do think that perhaps we're close to that. Do uh, do you? How do you feel about that? We're getting closer. I mean, mm-hmm. um, you know, we we're going to launch with some luck the James Webb Space Telescope in 2018, mm-hmm. um, and that would actually be able to show us uh, on which planets uh, that it's likely that to, for them to have liquid water on their surface, which we think is an absolutely necessary ingredient for life. And also will show us, uh, you know, the composition of the atmospheres of some of these planets. And if we discover on another planet that there is, for example, an, a, a high abundance of oxygen, ozone, and so on, those are pretty good biosignatures. I mean, signatures for, for some form of life forms. Sure. Uh, they have attributes that point us in the direction of where to look. That's right. Uh, and and that's important. Now, before we run out of time, where can listeners today get a copy of Brilliant Blunders, and how can they keep track of your blog and your work? Well, hopefully they can get a copy of the book in any bookstore or, or of course, in Amazon or at, at Amazon and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it should be in every bookstore. Uh, to, to keep track of my blogs, I, I run a blog that's called A Curious Mind. Uh, which they can read, you know, if they just search under my name and a curious mind, they will find it. Um, the Huffington Post also posts my all my blogs, so they can read it there if they, you know, Google my name and Huffington Post. So, uh, so there are many places to read about the stuff I write. Well, that is our program for today. But before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Dr. Livio. Thank you so much for having me. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or send me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're all over the Internet, so drop me a line and let me know what you thought about our conversation with Dr. Levio. And if you missed the full interview with Levio or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and also our new YouTube channel, where you'll find new videos regularly posted. And in particular, take a look at my video picks for the week. They're designed to help us see how brilliant, fallible, and miraculous the human organism truly is. Even with all our bickering and bad behavior, we're a creature, a creature like none other. And I, and I think you'll come away with that conclusion yourself when you take time to visit my video picks on our new YouTube channel. I also want to thank listeners who've ordered their copy of The Watchman's Rattle from our website. As you know, 
not 70, 80, 99 percent, 100 percent goes toward expanding the reach of the cost of report, including to members of our armed forces who are serving abroad. So if you haven't done your part yet, I want you to go to RebeccaCosta.com right now and place your order for an autographed copy of The Watchman's Rattle. In the blink of an eye, the holidays will be here, and you really can't beat a book with a custom dedication as a gift. So go to RebeccaCosta.com right now and put in your order before the rush. Next week, we are going to be speaking to former senator and governor of Indiana, Mr. Evan Bayh, who, as you know, stepped away from politics after a long and distinguished career. He'll be with us to weigh in on everything from what to do about the debt ceiling to the pros and cons of arming rogue rebels in the Middle East. So don't miss Evan Bayh next week right here on the Costa Report. I also want to uh, thank my guests during this first hour Dr. Mario Livio, for joining us for uh, what I consider to be a fascinating conversation. And uh, and I hope that I didn't uh, throw a wrench in the works for having shown up in the studio today a little underslept. (laughs) Uh, I apologize for that. I'm I'm usually right on my game. But boy, when when you don't give me enough sleep, this is what you get, folks. Uh, hopefully they'll let me uh, get proper sleep uh, before next week's show and uh, we and I can come back bright and fresh. Uh, again, next week we'll be with uh, Mr. Evan Bayh. So uh, be sure you set your schedule, set your clocks, set your smartphones. Don't miss Evan Bayh right here on the Costa Report, the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. And now we're going to uh, go to the second hour of the Costa Report and more riveting radio by your one heck of a tired host. (laughs) Uh, Join us during the next hour. We're going to have another post-partisan hour of radio following these important messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. A few years ago, I noticed I was feeling increasingly tired. My fatigue was so intense that I got to the point sometimes when I got home from work, I couldn't even remember the drive. The excessive tiredness and forgetfulness, not to mention my snoring that constantly woke up my husband, prompted me to get a sleep test. The results showed that I have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common disorder. In fact, 50 to 60% of those who snore have it. Many couples accept snoring as an inevitable part of nightly life, but sleep apnea is associated with serious health problems, such as the risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and even heart failure. Treatments for sleep apnea range from simple lifestyle changes to breathing machines to surgery. Treating my sleep apnea has changed my life. Armed with information, you too could be on your way to a restful night's sleep and a healthier life. Learn more at wakeuptosleep.org or call 877-389-8868. 